Uno, dos, la, tres. La, la, la tena. Welcome everybody to Letter Now, a podcast where we nurture the creatives, illustrators, designers, and makers of tomorrow today. My name is Martina Flora. I'm a lettering artist, author, educator, and the host of the show. And today we will be talking about creating unique work. We'll be answering questions like, is there a magic formula to create work that stands out? How do you find your niche without limiting yourself creatively? Is it necessary to work by yourself to be able to find your artistic voice? How relocating cities can affect your career? This and a lot more we will discuss today with our beautiful, talented designer, Marta Cerda, an award-winning graphic designer based in Barcelona. Her main body of work focuses on the boundaries between typography and illustration. Before founding her own studio in 2008, Marta moved, uh, worked in advertising agencies and design studios across Europe. On her own, she has contributed to global projects calling for design, illustration, and custom typography for art, culture, editorial, and advertising clients. Her work has been recognized by professional organizations, including the Type Directors Club and the Art Directors Club, where she was named as an ADC Young Gun. You can find her and her work on martasarda.com and on Instagram at martasarda. I will add this to our show notes so that you can find her and her work. So hi, Marta. How are you doing hi, today? Hi, Martina. Good. How are you? <laughs> Very good. I'm so happy to have you today. Um, I was telling Marta before we started the show that I we haven't met in person yet, although I, I have known your work for so long. Uh, but I once saw her on uh, at an airport and I recognized her because I saw her on pictures and <laughs> magazines and stuff. And I didn't dare to say hello. So today is like the opportunity to actually talk to you. And I'm really happy to have you on the show. Good, 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 good. No, no, I wish you had told me something. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah totally. It would have been nice. Definitely, I would do that next time. So, Marta, it's yes. so good to be talking to you because, as I said, I've been following your work for a long time. And what I always found fascinating is how different every piece of your work is. And, you know, when you get to see Marta's work, um, you will first tend to think that, you know, she is a lettering artist because much of her work is typography heavy. But then you realize that she also works with photography, illustration. Um, she's actually all over the place when it comes to, you know, design and illustration. Um, and it's really hard to put you into a category. So I want to ask you, like, is this on purpose? Do you intentionally try to stay out of categories with your work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think... Like, I think, like, from the maybe 90s or 2000 onwards, in graphic designers tend to specialize so much that now being a graphic designer and doing a custom font, I don't do, like, uh, typography that, that can be reading small, um, that need, like, a lot of technical um, um, knowledge. Mm. Um, but but before graphic designers used to have illustration and typography and photography and all these as 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 tools to work and and I didn't do it on purpose but because of the work that I liked much maybe yeah, Milton Glaser all, all the people maybe from the 70s and the 60s uh, or maybe earlier too um, I, I I I didn't even thought of that but I I, I just had a project and but since the very beginning while I was working in other companies too like I have to make a catalog for toilet margin mm -hmm. and I used a lot of illustration like I did like rush art uh, rush art, you know the rush art, um paintings those that are symmetric for for psychology uh -huh, so I I made, see. yeah I illustrated those with with the water of the toilet like uh, uh, and then when I had the chance to do like um, a logo, I made the font myself, you know, so I tried to 
to find the resources in me because there was maybe not money to buy an illustration. So it was like, okay, I do it myself, mm. uh, you know? And then I find that this is how I like to approach projects. And maybe sometimes I need someone to help me, but usually I'm the one like um, doing the stuff. But I don't think it's that special. Maybe now because we have been specializing ourselves so much, but it's nothing new. It's quite old. In fact, I think it's more like I'm a graphic designer. Not that simple. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Like it seems that you see, you know, you see illustration, typography, layout, all as tools that enable you to do your work as a graphic designer. And exactly. I can totally relate to the idea of trying to solve everything on your own terms and kind of like, you know, trying to make the illustrations and not having to hire an illustrator yeah. to do that. And mm -hmm. through that kind of learning how to, you know, how mm -hmm. to illustrate, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that something I really like about bringing designers and artists like you um, onto the show is that like designers like you that have so if you look at Mar um, at Marta's uh, website and you or you check on her Instagram you will see that she has a very eclectic approach so also within her graphic design um, work um, you know touching on illustration touching on typography touching on layout and, and on all these tools that you named before if you look at her work it's very eclectic sometimes it looks very vintage sometimes it looks futuristic sometimes it looks um, you know like um, kind of made of plastic sometimes it looks uh, you know it's it, you really mm -hmm. approach projects in such a different way and what I really like about that is that you know, bringing artists like you onto the show is that I know that many of our listeners are wondering about or are, you know, in their minds is this concern of finding their own style. Style, yeah, yeah. Wow. And I've been worried about this for a long time, so I can explain a lot of things. Yeah, and I think that it could be refreshing for them to see what your path was and how, you know, how you experienced this throughout your um, your career and you know the, through that they may understand that you know they can they can also do it without a specific style and they can also thrive without finding you know putting themselves into a certain category so I would like to ask you first um, how did you manage to kind of stay out of a specific style because also as a designer or as an artist I can imagine that you um, you you find yourself more comfortable into you know certain styles or doing certain work, right? And how did you manage to stay out of a certain style and category? And also, how do you manage to get work when you're not following it? You're not falling into a, in a specific category. Uh, for, for me, it's more a thing that uh, it's. Uh, it's against my nature to, I get bored. Like if I do, I feel like I'm repeating myself mm. and I'm very harsh on me. And it's like, well, I'm just repeating, this is easy. You know, and I have some works that look similar. The third time I do this similar thing, it might have acceptance among the, 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 the sector. And, but for me, uh, it's a bit like, I did it like I know that it wasn't difficult you mm. know what I mean when it's mm. not difficult I don't know why I, I find that it's like it's not worth it I don't know why but it's a mental thing um so how how did it happen so I think here I have to stop because a lot of times I thought that this was against my um so not, not having a style is worst, I mm. thought, many mm. times. Because you, if you are the Marta that does the 3D lettering, like plastic, then clients are easier to find you. Right? Someone in China wants to make a lettering plastic, it's Marta Sarda. In Los Angeles, it's Marta Sarda. When you can sometimes do this, and then sometimes do that, and then sometimes do the other, it's more difficult to get clients. Mm. 
Mm. Know what I mean? Yes. So that's, I don't know if commercially is the best approach. I think in long term is better. Because maybe I haven't had like a boom, like a boom ever in my life mm. professionally. I think like, like fast. It's been super gradually, gradually during throughout the years. And I think that's been good in the way that it allowed me to, um, yeah, not to have like a short, fast career, you know, that, okay, people have seen your plastic lettering 100 million times and they have enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's also a fear of, of burning the candle too fast. Yeah, and but, it's this idea of being trendy, right? Like uh, yeah. when perhaps you're you have this this specific style that is trendy, but once it's gone, it's just gone, and you're left yeah, with gone. with nothing, right? And exactly, that's that's fear that makes me fear. Make me fear. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, that verb. And how do you manage? Because I can imagine that often clients come to you, or it happens to me that whenever a client approaches me, they will reference some of my artwork. And for me, this is great. I love when they do that, when they say like, hey, I would really like to go in this direction that I saw, you know, I saw this piece on yeah. your portfolio that resonated Sometimes with me. And and how how do you manage to still be doing new work that doesn't look like previous work you have done when you have clients that come to you referencing previous work or maybe that doesn't happen to you I don't know how no, your experience it is happens. it happens I think I repeat myself a lot but sometimes like I get to hmm. it's difficult because it always is like I want to but then for example not for the bucket project that we were talking before going online Mm. Uh, to give a little bit of context of what the uh, what the project uh, or how the project is that we're talking about is it like a, a like a magazine illustration is it a cover yeah. or it's a, yeah. it's it's supposed to be a cover mm -hmm. and 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 the references were like a typography project that i had and an illustration project that i had that was very simple and it had a lot of color mm -hmm. so i thought vale let's go to the illustration and I'm going to use color and that's going to be it. <laughs> let's see if they, but for example, for the Vogue, I had a lot of freedom. I could do whatever I want and I don't think they would have say no. Mm -hmm. And the other project that they were referencing that a lot of people like reference it to me, I had total freedom too, mm. because these are projects that are more like collaborations. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. With the commercial so, ones, it's different because they want to be safe. Mm. It's like, okay, I'm not going to allow you to take risks mm. because I have. there's a lot of money involved. But mm. there's a lot. another thing that you can see my website. There are a lot of projects that if you think like, oh, how much money is this and that and that? Not much. Mm. But those are the projects that I put online and then the commercial clients come and with... Um, with expectations of have something similar. They come, they tell me, then I repeat myself. I don't care, they pay well. It goes to whatever brand. I don't post it because I feel super bad because it's like repeating, you know? Mm. But this happens a lot, mm. you know? But yeah. That's an interesting approach because what you do is essentially to keep commercial work kind of steady in terms of like you react to the references that the client presents and you totally. make the, ha the client happy in that sense that, you know, you, yeah. you give them what they expect. But on the other hand, you create these projects that you said like they don't bring money. There are collaborations or personal work, but you put them on your portfolio so that there's new clients coming after that kind of work. And yeah. this is... This is what keeps your exactly. your work expanding, right? Like it's kind of you're kind it's of balance, yeah. And now it's more happening that, that all these collaborations are getting paid, like not much, but getting paid. That before it was like nothing. So now 
people understand like, oh, okay, if I go to Marta, I have to pay her or something. You know what I mean? Before, yeah. no, but now. So that is, it got better in this sense. But yeah, I think I think like the website and the portfolio is like a menu. If you put them chicken, people are gonna ask you for chicken. If you put them sausage, you're gonna ask you for sausage. You know what I mean? If I put what I do commercially, that I'm not like 100 because obviously it needs to, it needs to be, it needs to be. I don't know. It, it's commercial. It needs mm. to be whatever the marketing team says and i'm not gonna go against like a company of 2000 people thinking that are only thinking of that campaign and think that that way of saying things is better mm. you know what i mean yes but they for whatever they know that style and it's like ah, oh, they think it's gonna work yeah totally and i want to just do a, a small follow-up question because you mentioned collaborations and you mentioned that now you are getting paid for those collaborations and i i know that the listeners might, might might be thinking like hey i thought that collaborations were just you know things that you do for free to expand your portfolio and no. i'm really i'm really curious on what these collaborations are about and um how did you get there to be paid for collaborations and for creating personal work like years ago I got super stressed because I got like, I don't know, three, four emails very often. Like, can you collaborate with this magazine and do this for free? Uh, can you do this or that for free? Uh, a lot of things for free. And it's like, at the beginning, they cheat you with the thing of um, that, that you're going to be visible, your work is going to be visible. Then you see that that is bullshit. I'm going to tell you, everyone, that is bullshit. But from time to time, uh, when I had no work, and then it's like, okay, I, I want to try this. I want to, I'm starting with 3D, for example. Uh, for example, with me, you know, with, with CGI, how did I implant this into my commercial work? It was first accepting things that were not, okay, I can, if, if this doesn't go well, It's not, it's not the end of the world, you know mm. what I mean? With collaborations, and I started, I don't know, collaboration with Amnesty International, a poster that I was for, not for an exhibition, or for free, of course. Okay, but then I, I try here to do, but, but I always try that I, um, that I also take advantage of that, because yeah. otherwise it's like... Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, because you are taking on work, essentially, that is you know, perhaps it's not paid, but for you, you have that one goal in mind. That is, okay, I will take this work. I won't be paid for that, or I will be paid very few. But then I will negotiate that I will have completely creative freedom. So I will do whatever I want. I will explore a new style for myself. And this is the way you're going to be paid, like yeah. in having that space to explore. Great. So, Marta, as you know, this is a listener-driven show, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about your stories and experiences as we go down the questions today. Um, we will start with messages coming from social media. And our first question is from Joe on Instagram. Um, so the question says, with so many others doing great work out there, how do you create work that stands out? And Marta, we often receive questions like uh, this one on the podcast, which, which address the concern that the market is oversaturated. We have the, the perception that the market is oversaturated, that there's a lot of artists and designers doing great work out there. And it seems more relevant than ever that, you know, that we need to create really good work. And I want to pass it to you now and ask you, what was the process for you what was the formula for creating good work or work that is unique if there's any formula but i i just want to to hear from you what what do you think are the essential elements to create work that is unique to stand out in the crowd of illustrators or designers what are the elements that make your work unique in relation to other people out there, other options out, out there? Um, I think you, 
these are like two questions how you make it to make it unique and how you make it to to stand out because mm. you you may have work that is unique and you may not be standing out mm. no yeah yeah no standing out you mean like like get, getting visible in the in the industry no so to make a work i think that is standing out for you and that you think it's unique i think it needs to be well crafted well crafted doesn't mean that it needs to be i mean well crafted in pair of what you're trying to do with mm -hmm. your direction i mean you maybe you are doing something that is like super punky and punk and and it needs to be well but done no but it needs to be very badly very well but done no? like mm. well crafted and it, for me it needs to have like a sense of fearless not trying to please too much mm. because then then you get re repeat repeated no you repeat what other what others do if if you have this sense of fearless in a in a work you're seeing uh, the work gets like more unexpected and I think it will enhance better with, with the viewer. But I don't think there's a formula for that, huh? like, because otherwise machines would be doing the work for us. Um, and to get visible, that's another, o sea, if you, you, you can do that and not getting like super standing out. Hmm. No? So you can that still, can happen. you can still do unique work, but don't, you know, not be getting the visibility or really standing out from not, the... not fast no mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like if we're talking with people that is starting like okay but it's not happening no like in a year it's like yeah mm. don't, don't rush like things take time no mm. so i guess time is one and consistency throughout the time it's um uh, it's important to I love that. I have a formula. You just said a formula. Look, <laughs> I, oh, yeah. know I know that there's no, no formula, but, no, um, but yeah, maybe. and of course, everyone, you know, it depends a lot on how everyone uh, brings their own personality and their own interests in it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's, mm -hmm. that plays a big role, like your own story and, you know, how you you grew up and where did you grow up and uh but i i've seen like you i've i've listed here a couple of things like well crafted plus fearless that on top of time and consistency so yeah I you think know maybe a good mix yeah i love that good um great so i have a couple of follow-up questions related to creating unique work I, i've been reading you know before this um this show i was doing a little bit of research and i read that you started your freelance journey after many years of working for agencies and design studios and i read that at some point you decided to do to go freelance because mm -hmm you felt that this was a necessary step to develop your own voice and mm -hmm. I would love for you to tell us a little bit more about this and that decision and why did you think that this will allow you to develop your own voice as a graphic designer? When you are in, inside a team, like I was super lucky yeah, that in the last team I was working, they were giving me a lot of freedom and I was, it allowed me to start like seeing like, oh, I want to do things this way, you know? Perhaps you can tell a little bit like what, what, where did you work before going freelance? In which agencies were you working? Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, I worked in, in Germany, mm -hmm. like in Grey Worldwide, in Dusseldorf, then in the Golden Bliss in, in Munich. Then I worked in El Laboratorio, which is an agency in Barcelona. Then in another one, I was called Pavlov. Then I worked with a teacher. But that was super like short time, huh? with a teacher for like, six months and then the first job like steady was in Turmix and in Turmix they already had like this vision on type that they had they were staying like I don't know one whole day deciding a font like I don't know uh, for branding huh? we were working mainly for branding but we were looking at a detail level of detail that I wasn't used to yeah and 
like for example in Basaba, like they gave me i ah, have to do a book um that is um for a music uh, so there's a, there's a music compilation and you you do the book with the with the lyrics so for, for those that are listening um you will want to watch this episode on youtube because um marta is showing right now that project she's talking about we'll try to describe it as good as we can uh for those that are listening on a podcast platform yes so she's showing right now a book with illustrations that is combining illustrations and uh typography or lettering yeah, yeah exactly so I was already going every time I wanted to from the very beginning. So I had the chance to do my own things when I was in a, but not in every project. Like you get like anxious, like, okay, I want to do that like over and over and over, no? And be yeah. more in control of what I want, the projects that I want to say yes, the projects that I want to say no. Mm. And what was the time span in which you work for agencies and studios? What was like in total? What would you say that was like? Like agencies in total, maybe a year and a half. Like, but in so total, we were, putting together all these agencies, uh, like five, five or six years, five okay. or six years, yeah. Um, I mean, because uh, the trainings, I did a lot of trainings. So that, that was important. I did a lot of trainings. And when I finished studying, my level was quite high mm. in because I worked in a lot of agencies, so I was already fast and but mainly fast <laughs> because in the agencies you, <laughs> you learn to be fast if something is this fast. But, but then, yeah, in Turmis, I stayed there two, two years and then in Masada, two months. So, yeah, then I wanted to have my, and if I said yes to a project that I didn't like, it was because I got money out of it. You know what I mean? That mm. at the end of the month, it's like when you work in a studio, you get, you get the same mm. amount at the end of the month if you do a nice project or you do a super ugly project, you know? But at least now if you say yes to a project that is a lot of money, then it's like, okay, but at least it's a lot of money. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah. And when you are in another studio, you have to eat things you don't want to eat. Yeah. Yeah. You get no reward for that. So um, it allowed me to take the projects that I was more interested in. The first year was tough and I had to take this, like a lot of collaborations and it was super tough. Mm. Uh, and I worked a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And, but, but it went well, it went well. I began to be like... Um, showcased in blogs and be on the internet and then and then yeah and then it started amazing so and i wanted to ask you i'm always interested in knowing when did you realize i i ask this often to my guests like when did you realize that this was the path you wanted to follow like what was that a specific moment or Q, or that specific project that you did that you said, like, I love doing this, I want to do more of this. Is there any that you can remember or any specific Q um, or sign uh, mm -hmm. or person that inspire you to like, continue down this road? But you mean when you were a child and you thought I want to do graphic design or when you were a graphic designer and you thought oh, I want to do more lettering and illustration it could be it could be both like it could be that you take this from the moment you decided to go down the path of graphic design or the moment you decide to go down the path of graphic design in the way you do it because you know what you know within graphic design you have a lot of different approaches you can go down um the brown the branding road you can go down your kind of road which is like more mm, unique kind of graphic design work uh or illustration work so when i think what was key in, in in me it was that during the while i was studying like um alex truchut and i be, began to date and we were already living together, living together, and 
I started working, doing the work from the university and we were both like, well, because of the university, they were all the time like, ah, the grandfather of Alex, no, that does this super veloz. Uh, ah, okay, we, so you're speaking about Alex Rochut. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, so just to give you a little bit of context here as well. <laughs> so Alex Rochut is uh, also a, a lettering artist. Uh, I don't know how he defines himself right now, but uh, he's very well known for his typography and 3D realistic work. And uh, he's also from Barcelona. And um, so you, I didn't know yet that you had studied with him, that you went together to the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. We, so, we, yeah, yeah. So, and we, we were living together, mm. same, living together for nine years. And we were like, well, you know, obsessed. Like, and I think it, it all began maybe with his grandfather, that he was doing this font modular fonts that with these models they could do he uh, so he made these models that allowed printers to design their own uh, letterings but also their own illustrations with the same uh, models and and this in the university was all the time like wow this is so cool and we began to read you know things and in we began to apply this because, for example, in this work that it's super early, I, I tried to do the same. No, I apply the the in the letters the same rules that in the um, illustration. No, to to have like fat parts and then super thin parts, and 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 here the same. That's great. Super so for those from... for those that are listening on the podcast and are not are not watching on YouTube. Uh, the artwork that she is showing right now is actually modular typography and she's using these modules inspired on this project Super Veloz um, that is created by the grandfather of yeah, Troshut. What, what, what is his, his name? Um, Joan. Joan Troshut, which was like a, a pioneer in creating this modular typography but that looks very modernistic in its way. It's like I think in that moment or at that moment, it was something really revolutionary because it allowed so many possibilities and so many, um, yeah, so many ways of using typography and using those modules. So, yeah, exactly. sorry. And I think that, that conceptually, this was like we had that very present at home and in the university and... Naturally, but you want to do the same, like, oh, th this is like a super nice, like a formula, no, mm. to solve a lot of things, you know, and well, and, yeah, and then is, yeah, I think that was, a, that was like very important to, to have this view on, on graphic design, that is kind of vintage, a vintage view of graphic design. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so it was really like a project that really stayed with you and that you continue no, no, applying. No, it's not a project. No, no, no. It's a way of seeing things. It's a way that, of seeing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, of, it's a mental, it's a concept of that you don't separate in your mind typography from illustration. Mm -hmm. It's the same. So conceptually is the same. And then, no, this, this project is an example. I did, I did many in that period or before, like, okay, I do... Just thinking that the power of an illustration is exactly the same. It's just that one shapes, you, you know, the meaning of them and the other ones go to know the meaning of them, but it's different. Um, but you know what I mean? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Like thinking that they're both means to convey some sort of message, whether you do it to with, communicate, to communicate. Exactly. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So it makes a lot of sense, like looking at your work. And for those that are listening, if you look at uh, Marta's work, you will see that there is really like a very fine line between what, it, what illustration is and typography is. And I think it makes a lot of sense now that you mentioned that a specific pro uh, project. I'm going to add a link to our show notes so that people can understand what we are talking about this um, Super the Veloz. It's not on my side. Ah, the it's not on your Veloz. side. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, so, yes, that, yes, yes. so that they know what this, exactly. what, what this is about and, um, and how that concept kind of comes together in your work. So let's move on to our next question coming from Fur on Instagram. Um, and this is a little bit unrelated, but I, I, you, you will see what I mean. How do you work internationally and have the same 
persuasiveness in another language. And yeah, Marta, I, I chose this question because it's a, this is a reasonable concern, but also I know that many of our listeners are thinking like, hey, I want to work internationally and I would love to work for people in different countries and not be limited to my local clients. And, and you know, answering these questions, this question, I feel it makes a, the, like the perfect segue to uh, speak about something that is very unique about you or very particular in your life. That is that you move countries many times. But before we touch on that, uh, yes, I really want to ask you like uh, how how working in other languages affects your uh, your work and how do you deal with that? You have to understand what, uh, what your the letter uh, the language that you are working with. I think like sometimes I've been approached to do like kanjis in Japanese and in in Chinese mm. and I. I, I, I I, I, I said no, it's like I, I have no idea how to, how, I don't know if this is well done, if this is readable and my work works a little bit in the boundaries of this is readable, it's not readable, how can I know if I don't know the, the, the shape, you know what I mean? Yes. I just did it once for, um, for, the, yeah, for an NGO of, of Tibet that I wrote something in in Tibetan but um, but we were like talking a lot with the guys like hey this is understandable and I made a step is this okay yes or not but um, for me it's difficult in the sense that this if I don't know as I work very in the limit of what is readable and not uh, it's very easy to go in a crazy to do and do a crazy thing but it's not okay so I tend not to say no yeah if it's and, in Chinese or something like this or, or I don't know Arabic yeah that makes a lot of sense and there are so many particularities to each script because these are scripts right like the Japanese mm -hmm. or the or the uh, the Chinese uh, script or or actually they have several scripts uh, the Arabic script there's so many complexities and a big story behind each one of the scripts that you actually need to understand it to be able to work I think with so, that, no? Right? There is this, 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 this branch no, of typography that says that well, no, my, my calligraphy teacher was, well, if you don't understand the language, you don't write it. And he went on studying like Chinese, the degree of Chinese culture <laughs> in order to, to write kanji. But, And but how is it um, how is it when you have to work with clients in another language and you you are you know you have to explain your mm, project or your view, ideas no? or your point of view yeah. how how do you deal with that do yeah, you feel this I, is a limitation uh you mm, yeah I don't think so because I, I, I I'm not very good at talking I'm not very good at talking no, not in English, in Catalan, in Spanish, in whatever. So I tend to do my presentations like super visual, like, like my talks. When you go to my talks, I want you to look at the screen, not to look at me, you know, and to make the screen like explaining you things like maybe in an infographic way, mm. you know, so that my lack of abilities here will be there. You know what I mean? And in my presentations too, I tend to do like really nice presentations. Like I spend maybe, I live usually one day and a half just to prepare the whole presentation, you know? And this I learned from, from also from doing like some freelance in, in like in Wyden and Kennedy or in 71 and in Amsterdam, that they had a person, they were hiring a person only to do the presentation. So this how this was how important was the presentation. Mm. So, yeah, they do that on top of explaining it very well, but me, you know, I do that. That's great because you bridge the gap of, like, the language gap with an outstanding presentation. I think that's such a good idea. Like, I know that also we have touched on the topic of being introvert and not having enough people's skills 
when you're a freelancer or when you're yeah. a freelance artist and stuff and you're bridging that gap by explaining visually um, your ideas and your concepts, which is, I think, brilliant. And I'm going to totally apply it to my work. But now I want to really dig deep into into how you move countries several times. You lived in New York, Amsterdam, LA, and now you live in Barcelona. Um, and how do you feel that this influenced your work and career, both positively and negatively? I, I bet that there's some horror stories there and Horrible. some, yeah, yeah. some yeah. amazing yeah. stories there. So I want to hear a little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think in... In general, it, I have a it's a good it's a good thing. But um, yeah, when when you move to a place where you don't know anyone and you have to build a little bit of a circle, hmm. so um, you write this person and this other person and you try to meet people and everything. But it's hard because no one knows you. Uh, in Amsterdam, it was easier because it was like in Europe. And it, it was easier, but in LA, I found, well, now there is more like a lettering culture and everything. No, there has been a lot of lettering culture there uh, f for, for a long, long time. But when I went there in 90, uh, in 2013, 14, hmm. when I was going there and show my portfolio, it was, everyone was like, well, what is this moving? And a lot of people told me like, oh, if I give you work, this is not what I want to see. They wanted like Photoshop effects and, and things that were not like totally not what I wanted to do. And I felt like really, really uh, frustrated, frustrated, like <laughs> super frustrated. Like there was a moment that I felt like okay, no, no one understands me here, like because it's the city of entertainment. And and if it's graphic, it's like, what? So, but you have to make a lot of efforts so to, to get to people. So, mm. for example, there I learned, like, okay, I need to start to make my things moving, you know? Mm. I, uh, you know, animation. Mm. I don't have a lot of skills, but I thought, okay, why not? Let, let's, let's, you know, let's start animating things. It was also in LA that I thought, like, okay, let's make these letterings like um, three dimensional because maybe I don't want to use Photoshop and maybe effects, but maybe if I do 3D and you know what? So it makes you, um, because if I wouldn't have moved to Barcelona, I don't think I would have had the need of doing all that, you know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, like uh, kind of adapting to the context and kind mm. of understanding what the market you are in needs as well, right? Within what exactly. you want to do. And mm -hmm. what were the motivations for you to move from Barcelona to, well, actually you moved to a lot of other places, lot like lot of places, to yeah. Germany, to Munich, mm -hmm. you said. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, all the times there was this, this one thing of, of being in another culture and getting to know another culture, like the... The first time I went like alone as a freelancer, I, I went to New York and mm -hmm. it was like, it made me feel like it was a city that things were happening there because when I, I, I was going there every once in a while to show my portfolio uh, since 2008. And I was seeing that when I was going there, even if you go, like it doesn't happen in Barcelona, you go to a big company, you say, hey, I, can I show my portfolio? And they say, yes, okay, come on for, for Thursday. A two and you want to give a talk yeah okay i will make the whole team come and this doesn't happen here and 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 maybe in two months they oh i have an assignment for you i was like let's go to new york because things happen there and people is like so open you get to know like people you admire a lot and there, there's like there's no like a super gap that is like oh this person i cannot even meet, meet this person so it this was the main motivations that to to yeah to be in other cultures that are like di different and yeah that's interesting because i personally get a lot the question of whether moving to berlin was a necessary step to achieve a certain success in my career. You know, for those that are, don't know, I was born in Buenos Aires. I lived there in Argentina. I lived there for most of my life and I moved here 
in my late 20s and um, I actually started my lettering studio um, back then in that moment where I moved when I moved to uh, Berlin and I wonder if you think that moving to New York had to do with your success in some way or another if you so have I... made it anyways of course you you are you cannot know this because you have no. you can only choose one way in life and um yeah. you know but do you feel that staying where you were born and where you were you know you had your your yeah. contacts and you had your family and stuff would have made um or would have helped you made make it in in your career wow. I don't know like how you felt when you started like in a country that you didn't know how it worked. But when I went to New York, I was already a bit like known in Barcelona. Mm. So uh, I felt a bit of confidence that I had to work and I was already working for clients in the US and in LA. So I didn't go there like, uh, but, but. I think if I had stayed here, maybe I wouldn't have grown that much. But, um, but because of this that I told you that I, I had to, I had to survive. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And in order to survive, I, I had to. I don't know. I think I would have done it anyway here. Huh? The, the, the mm -hmm. 3D and and knowing other um, tools because it's in my thing but moving it allowed me to know people and sometimes now I get pro projects from these people I met you know it's not mm. that the whole thing of the whole bunch of projects that I get are from are the result of m moving but some part maybe a 10% yes you know yeah Yeah, that's interesting because also what I hear from what you say is that kind of moving countries put you in this position of vulnerability where you felt that you had to <clears throat> proactively start doing things and finding opportunities for yourself, which you might not have done if you would have stayed where you are because um, these were given to you kind of and... You know, moving, country, moving countries kind of puts you in, a, in or creates some sort of awareness in you. Like, okay, this is new. I have to find my way. And kind of finding new clients and new connections is part of the whole thing. Also finding a new apartment, like um, learning a language and all this stuff, right? Mm, so, yeah. yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. Kind of like growing as a person or exploring new things to learn um, mm -hmm. have also a positive or a, an impact on your creative skills and your expansions yeah, yeah. as an art uh, your expansion as an artist so that makes yeah yeah I think so. that makes a lot of sense and I want to ask you if you can think of steps if you can look back And look at your career or the path you have done from the moment you left art school and where you are right now. What do you think are the steps that really made a difference? And perhaps you can think of those as milestones. What do you think were the big milestones in your path to, you know, from leaving art school as a student to being where you are right now running your own business working internationally doing the kind of work you want to do um i want to paint the picture for someone who is listening and perhaps is just studying or they find themselves in a place where they would like to do something different or they would like to pivot careers or they feel that they have reached a plateau i mm. i'm interested in your Path and how those steps may look like for them. Yeah, I think the first one was um, I really wanted to work, so I took all the trainings that I could 
and I was not doing cafes, but if I had to stand during two days or five days in a row things, I wouldn't complain. Like I would try to get the much the best out of every small chance that I got. Hmm. I think that was different from my mates uh, at school that everyone was like, no, I think trainees have have to be paid. Like Mm. it should be illegal not to be paid. In my case, all were, mm, no, not all, but mm, a lot of them weren't paid and it was like, but mm, being in, in, in ad agencies, despite it was absolutely not what I wanted to do, if you are in a humble place, you see that you have a lot to learn. For example, I learned to be super fast. And this is super important mm-hmm. too, because then it allows you to focus on other things, not on I, how I do this. I take me a million times to do that. No? Mm. So doing a lot of um, practicums, it was very good for me, I think. And then, and then once I did that and worked in places that I saw, okay, now I see I don't want to work in advertising. I thought I wanted to work in advertising. There's a moment you see, no, I don't want to work in advertising. And then there's a moment that you look, okay, what studios I want to work with? So the day that I started working in a tour mix, there was a studio that had uh, a lot of um, sensitivity for typography and for editorial uh, design, for graphic design, even for illustration, that was the first moment the door opened and it was like, oh, there, yes, this is where I want to be, no? And then, okay, after two years, I see I want to focus more on the illustration and typography. So I go to another studio that it's more focused on that. So you go and find a job where your specific a profile that you think you want to go, go for, they have the same profile. No? And then another milestone when 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 I won the ADC Young Guns, that it allowed. It was like a moment that I it, it allowed me to say, okay, I can start on my own. I I was already thinking, ah, oh, I want to start freelancing, but oh, how will I do it? So I I. I presented my work in the ADC I won, and then it was like, oh great, now I can go and show my and show my portfolio in the US because and I will be able to say to the New York Times, hello, I just want I won this year the ADC on guns. I would like to show you my portfolio, and the chances of getting an answer are higher. No. Mm. So this was the moment I said, okay, bah, let's go. No. I had like, yeah, that moment. So amazing. and from yeah, then on it was like now, yeah. Yeah, I wrote I wrote a couple of steps. Uh, I'm I'm gonna just um, repeat them back to you to see if, if I got mm-hmm. it right. So number one, after you left um, university or art school, you started to work, and you feel that this was essential for you to get fast. Uh, to become fast Be- at what you do before uh, when i finished school i already did one year of training so it was like amazing so the training was really important to you uh, yes kind yeah. of putting yourself in the position of doing real work and hmm. that led to step number two which is realizing what you don't want to do which was like exactly. i don't want to work for agencies i've done it it trained me it learned me it, it uh, taught me to be fast but this is not what I want to do, which leads to step number three, um, that is finding what you want to do and places where you can do that, which was, uh, you know, the, the next step was kind of finding this this job at uh, uh, Basava, I think, or... Sí, 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 yeah. Basava y Turmix. Yeah, and the step number four, when you started working in the studios that you really like the work they were doing, is identifying what are, what were the things that you really like doing within that work, which was illustration and typography. And you sort of narrow down your, your kind of interest. Mm-hmm. And there was one point 
the, which is the step number five that I wrote from what you said, is that you won this ADC Young Gun. This is a kind of like an award that um, that is given to um, new talents uh, under 30. Um, and this kind of gave you some sort of validation in terms of like, hey, yeah. I won this award. So now I have kind of like the confidence to, to go yeah. out there and knock some doors. And um, this is where you move to New York and the things start rolling, kind of like the mm -hmm. ball started rolling. So yeah, mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense. And thank you so much for sharing those steps uh, with us. To wrap up this part of the conversation, before we move on to the stories or the story time, um, I want to ask you a little bit about your solo exhibition. You, you, you just opened a solo exhibition in Barcelona in the Center of Contemporary Art La Sala, mm -hmm. um, right? Tell us about it. Yeah, in, in Milanova. Uh, yeah, so the people of Blanc, um, Blanc is, um, is a festival that they do here in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Uh, of design and they are doing every year an exhibition with, with one with one artist and they, they asked me and I am also doing a book a monograph of my work uh, with counterprint books and it was like okay um, I think the book had to be printed two weeks ago so it made sense that the exhibition was a, a uh, translation of the book so we were we would present the book in there and everything but sadly because of the um, lack of supplies and yeah that there's not enough paper uh, in the planet for everyone and it's gonna be delayed like a couple of months um, so the exhibition went on on its own but it's um, the exhibition and the book are are like a gradient of, of my work that starts with calligraphy or the influence of calligraphy in my work, custom typography, lettering, digital lettering, um, illustration within typography and illustration. So it's like a gradient from letters to drawing. Amazing. And this is going to be open until January 2nd, January 2nd, right? 2nd, yeah. So yeah. for those that are in Barcelona within that time, with it now, we are recording this episode in November 2021. It will be open until um, January 2nd, 2022 in Barcelona. So I'm going to add this. Um, the in link Villanova. In Villanova. So Barcelona, it's going to yeah. be, it's going to be, um, you know, you will find the information on the show notes for those that want to um, visit the exhibition. And... Some of this, I know that you told me before we started the podcast, some of this artwork is going to be also part of your online shop, right? Which is something that you're going to be yes. um, opening soon. Yes, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. So I have it ready. I had it ready to, to because of the book. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell also like um, illustration uh, posters because like the last couple of years... I get a lot of questions. Ah, oh, can you send me this or that? And I don't do it. And I feel like it's a miss, the thing that uh, I'm just missing, like not not selling, not selling the work that I do. So uh, yeah, it's gonna be open, like hopefully before Christmas. Yeah, amazing. So we're gonna add also a link to the show notes so that our listeners can find it. And Marta, we are moving on to our story time section. You own uh, you you know already that we all love stories. And in this section, we want to go beyond the perfectly curated lives that we normally share on social media. So we want mm -hmm. to allow space for real stories. And we want to hear about the biggest challenge or failure that you had as an artist and how that impacted your work and career. Is there any story that you would like to share with us and our listeners? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge in, in my work and in my life is that I'm, I'm, I'm very, very perfectionist. And, and this uh, sometimes can be like paralyzing. Um, for example, in social media, if you are perfectionists, like mm. super perfectionist, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, first, because I don't like to expose myself 
but then so I just expose my work. But when you are super perfectionist, you just want to post the works that are like 100% on your, that you think that are what you expected of, of that work. And then sometimes you, you don't post things that is like, okay, this is, it's worth like showing. And for the book, it has been like super challenging because the guys at Counterpring all were about how you don't show that and how you don't show that. It's like, oh, because I have to like let go. It's like, okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> I can show this, you know, and this is not, this goes against what the algorithm wants, that it's like posting all the time. And, and I, I, yeah, I struggle a lot with that. And how, how do you counteract this in your life? Like, how do you counteract the fact that you are a perfectionist and how do you try to deal with that? Or you don't I, at I, all? I, I do. I, no, I do a lot of therapy. Like, I do a lot of therapy. No, I, seriously. No, because this affects, like, all my life. I'm very, very, very perfectionist. And in a way, it uh, helps me do things. But on the other way, uh, no, it's not doing me good. But um, how, I mean, being aware, being aware of the thing is, being aware that you are overreacting to things is already like a step of just like, okay, let's pose this, doesn't matter, like, mm. because you, you know that you are over the thing. Um, but yeah, I think being, yeah, being conscious of that. I don't yeah, know the, the, the recipe for not being like that, but that makes I'm not, a lot I'm not sense. very free on. Huh? Yeah, I mean that, that makes a lot of sense. You can if you if you can see it, you can do something about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, be aware I mean, of you, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. So, uh, Marta, this is the end of our show. Uh, it was so yeah. great to have you here and to hear your stories and yeah, how your path. Uh, your creative path was. Um, so I want to ask you, where can people find you again? Uh, perhaps you can give your social media handles and your website or any other places where people can find you. Yeah, yeah. my website is martaserda.com and my Instagram is at martaserda and yeah, Twitter is the same, martaserda. Marta Great. So we will add all of this to our show notes, including uh, Marta's um, web shop and also the exhibition in Barcelona for those that want to visit that. Marta, to finish up, <laughs> what will you say to someone that is just starting? Uh, yeah, I would say trust yourself. Like um, if you have a lack of, of, of self-trust, uh, don't be obsessed with likes and followers like that will come at some point um even don't be obsessed of what your team in your job if you have a job uh, think and just try to do the best of the projects you you have in front of you because with the even with the smallest project you can you can get things i think and um yeah work hard and enjoy that's that usually comes with the naturally no but but sometimes then you that comes naturally if you like your job but 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 sometimes the joy goes goes away hmm. so remember that's super important to get good job done because otherwise yeah you, you notice that in the, in the job in the work too so and yeah that's it Thank you so much, Marta, for being here today. I appreciate you and I appreciate all the stories that you share with us. So this is it for those listening. You can find me, the host of the show, on social networks at Martina Flor on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you have a question or comments, go to martinaflor.com slash podcast where you can see previous episodes, find show notes, and send voice memos with your comments and questions. You can also watch these episodes on YouTube. Just go to martinaflor.com slash YouTube to find them. You can, of course, listen to all our episodes on your favorite podcast platform. If you love this episode, subscribe to this podcast. And if you leave us a review, it will help others find us. Thank you all for listening. 
Thank you, Marta, for being there. And see you in the next episode of Let Now. Bye-bye. Thank you, Martina.